Well, welcome. We are here to start a brand new series, and we're super excited about it. If you aren't very familiar with our rhythms and our patterns at McBick, we preach on mission and missional living usually about twice a year. You see these, uh, these series that we put together um, emphasizing mission because we think it is incredibly important to continue to share this story, God's story with you and invite you into his mission. Missional living is the primary demonstrative fruit of the life of a believer. It's commanded in scripture. It's evidence, it's the primary evidence of our relationship and our obedience to Christ. And we feel that it's the responsibility that we have as shepherds to continue to share it. So I hope that you don't go, oh, they're preaching on mission and missional living again. We hear this twice a year. I hope that's not where you are. I hope that you look forward to these series and that you find it exciting and it inspires you and you can't wait for them. I think that's the right heart posture for all of us. We, uh, as a staff, frame our series in little groups. So this one was put together by Pastor Jen, our children's pastor, Pastor Evan, our current middle school pastor, soon to be worship pastor, and myself. And over the next five weeks, um, Jen and Evan, and then Pastor Cody, our youth pastor, and uh, Pastor Lane will be preaching on this topic. We've decided to do it topically, so each one of us are going to preach on mission over the next five weeks, and we, de we decided in our prep that we would really seek the Holy Spirit, preach from our passion, use the scriptures that the Holy Spirit leads each one of us to. So for the next five weeks, we're going to be on this topic. You're going to hear from five different pastors. Um, I joked this morning as we gathered for pastoral prayer that we put Lane at the end, in part because he didn't help shape this series, it was a different team, uh, but I joked that he's at the end to clean up any messes the rest of us make along the way, theologically. I don't think that'll happen, but I joked about that this morning. Some of our goals for the series are to inspire and help every person in this congregation have a clearer vision of mission for your own life, to help remove obstacles that are in the way, and to help each person hear God to hear what God is saying to you. So we hope that as we open this series, that over the next five weeks, that will happen for every person that is connected with McBick. Uh, Mark 18, or Mark 16, 15 says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I joked with Elizabeth as we were, uh, as I was preparing the message that Every creature includes the cats that she loves so much. We're supposed to preach to every creature, every human, including the cats. Luke 14, 23, go out into the, into the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. This is a main task, a main mission of God, but I believe it's twofold. As we look across scripture, our mission is to introduce people to the gospel and to Jesus and, equally as important, to care for the oppressed, to bring justice to the poor, to the imprisoned, to the prostituted, to the orphan, to the widow. Anybody who is without love, without family, without hope, it is our role as the church and a main task of ours in Scripture to share God's love with those who are oppressed. I believe that's um, spoken throughout the entire Old Testament and through the New Testament. Jesus says things in the New Testament like you'll always have the poor with you. In the Old Testament, God told the Israelites, when you harvest your fields, leave the edges for the poor to glean from them. I love that he said leave the edges to make it easy for the poor to get to the field. Leave the edges. And he never qualified it. He didn't say care for the poor who are doing what you think they should or who are trying. Jesus didn't say that either. They just said do it. You're always going to have the poor with you. Care for them. Care for them. Help them. That includes the imprisoned, that includes the elderly, the widow, the orphans, anybody who's oppressed, 
and prostituted, those who are stuck in darkness and hopelessness. It is the job of the church to care for them. James 2 says that faith without works is dead. It's a dead faith. That means there's going to be fruit from the faith that we have in Christ, from the love relationship that we have, that we each have with Jesus, is going to produce some fruit. And that fruit should look like wanting to share the good news that we've experienced and are experienced. And that fruit should also look like concern, compassion, and action for those who are oppressed and marginalized and poor and hungry and homeless and prostituted and imprisoned. I've learned personally that staying focused on those jobs keeps me close to God, because I have to be, to, to do it, and it keeps me out of trouble and away from distractions because I'm busy. I wonder if most of us have figured that out. If we actually walk out what Scripture has said to us, if we actually put ourselves in a position, not just giving financially, though we need to do that too, but actually meeting the needs of the poor and the oppressed and sharing the gospel. We're pretty busy, and we need to be on our knees a lot, talking to Jesus about it, letting him fill us with compassion and love and his heart, giving us understanding about those that we're trying to share the good news with, those that we're trying to help. It keeps us up away from the distractions that we so often experience. Matthew 9, 35 through 38 says, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. So the problem isn't, it's not that there aren't people out there who want to and need the good news. God is saying that the harvest is ripe, which means he's prepared people's hearts to hear him, to hear the good news, and to receive him. Picture with me, I mean, we're in the middle of peach season. I mean, we're almost at the end of peach season, which hurts me. But picture with me a, a peach orchard that is just filled with ripe peaches. Just filled. Every tree is filled with it. But there are not enough workers to go pick the peaches off the trees. That's what God is saying. The problem isn't that there aren't ripe people out there waiting to hear the good news or to receive the love of Christ. The problem is the laborers. We don't have the laborers to go out. That's us. That's the church. If there's one thing that the world needs more than anything else, it's for the church to become active and dangerous to the kingdom of this world, to the darkness of this world. Active in prayer, active in sharing Jesus, active in seeking justice for the oppressed. I want you to imagine with me a second, just a church that is so alive and so passionate and so engaged with Jesus that the foster system gets cleared out. I've heard from John and Cindy King and Pastor Jen that the stats say that if every church, not every person, but if every church in the state of Pennsylvania took one foster child, that it would completely clear the foster system. Can you imagine that? I mean, you know how many churches there are in this area? What if every church took one or two foster kids somehow into the family of God? It would clear the foster system. What if... The church was so active, so engaged, so alive with the love of God and understanding that every prisoner in the state of Pennsylvania had a pen pal, someone who was praying for them, people who were going into prisons and leading Bible studies and caring for those who are imprisoned. They may never get out of prison, but they can meet God there, some of them. And some of them are going to get out, and they're going to make a difference in this world if they meet God in there. What if the church was so alive and so engaged and so active that the demand for prostituted people dried up? 
and there was no demand? And what if those vulnerable people who are often the ones who are prostituted were cared for and given the resources that they need? And that entire system of darkness dried up. What if the church was so alive and so active that all of the poor had enough food and were housed and supported in their basic needs? Jesus said to us in the New Testament, you're always going to have the poor with you. It was unqualified. They're always going to be here, and it's our job to make sure that they're fed, that they're housed, that they're supported, and that they know about Jesus. And hopefully, some of them will come out of that state. That's our hope. But we can't require it. We still have to care for them. If the church were as full and alive and active and engaged, I believe that every widow, an elderly person, would receive love and care and regular visits. The lonely would be set in families, as the scriptures say. And people who don't know Jesus would be regularly and repeatedly introduced to him in some way. To me, this is a picture of revival, a church that is that alive, that engaged, and that active. And it starts with us. Revival history shares the stories, if you read it, over and over and over, of moves of God, whether it be the Welsh revival, the first and second great awakening, salvation's happening, but then that results in people going out and caring for the poor and the orphans and feeding the hungry and caring for the homeless. If you really dig into revival history, you see that over and over. The reason we see that is because that's God's heart. It's his command in scripture. And as he moves through our lives, that's what happens. That is the fruit of the Lord moving through our lives. We are that move of God. This is Christianity. And I want to read to you how important it is to Jesus. From Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Do you hear that? Do you hear how important it is to Jesus that we understand the mission? I don't love the consequences of not understanding the mission. 
in that particular scripture. You know, I talked to the staff and I prayed and I talked to Jesus a lot and I was like, you know, this is where I feel led to read this particular passage of scripture. I don't want people to be motivated by guilt or fear or shame to go care for the oppressed. I want them, and I know that God wants people to be motivated by love and by the fruit of relationship with him. But also, we need to understand what the word of God says. It does say that if we don't get this, we're not going with him. Those are the words of Jesus, Matthew 25, 31 through 46, if you want to spend some time with him. And I don't say that to be overly heavy-handed or to try to scare anybody into serving uh, if you're not already doing that. But it's quite serious. The fruit of our relationship, our love relationship with Jesus, should be producing a desire to share the good news and to care for the marginalized and the oppressed, the ones that he cares about. My primary focus for these two important tasks of God are peace promise, that's where he called me, that's a mission and a ministry that helps women come out of sex trafficking and prostitution, I've given 16 years of my life to that. I also care for the poor and the oppressed in other ways because all of us have a circle of influence and we all come across neighbors and situations where we need to act and those are times when we need to be checking with God, the Holy Spirit. How would you have me act here? What would you have me give? What would you have me do? Again, it's not just funds. It would be easy to sit back and just give funds to missions and ministries, and God wants us to do that too, that are caring for the poor and the orphan and the widow and the oppressed, but he wants us to be involved in some way, in some actionable way in those missions. He wants us to, sac to sacrifice time and to have to be on our knees asking him how to do it because it's hard. He wants that for us because he loves us and because that's the picture of his heart for the world. It's the picture of, of the gospel. Um, I also believe that scripture has told us that it's our job to share the gospel wherever we are. I, like the rest of you, probably don't do this perfectly. I know I don't. I try, I pray, I repent when I feel like I've missed it and when I don't, when I haven't paid attention to God. Um, I have a little video um, as my kids and I have talked about this and they've seen me witness to people at water parks or the grocery store. Uh, we've joked about what that can look like and this is the caricature version of it. Will you play that video for me? Excuse me, sir. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you have time to talk about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Hey, don't run from the Lord. All right, so that is the running joke for the way mom might look to the rest of the world as I'm talking to people about Jesus in water parks and in grocery store lines and at Planet Fitness. These things have actually happened. I have a lot of stories. Um, Lane... Uh, put a teaser out a couple weeks ago that I had some stories because our team has been talking a lot about sharing the gospel and about evangelism. So I will tell the two stories that were more recent in my life um, that he was referring to. So, you know, I work in a church, so a lot of the people I hang out with already know Jesus at this point in my life. I didn't come from the church, so I have a long history of people that I have shared the gospel with and prayed for many, many years and prayed into the kingdom that come from my past that I'm, I'm very good friends with and love very much and continue to witness to. But in my day-to-day -day life, if I'm going to run into unbelievers, it's going to be as I shop and go to the gym or whatever. That's where I'm going to run into people. Um, the people that are probably the most unsafe from hearing the gospel are contractors who come to my house because they're going to be there a while and they're in my house, right? So this is kind of also a running joke and right now we're putting an addition on my house because my mom is going to come live with us. By the way, the word of God does say we are responsible to God to care for the elderly in our own families. It's very specific. My mom is coming to live in our home and um, she is building the addition because there's steps and blah, blah, blah. She had to have a space, right, without steps. So 
<clears throat> there was a demo and there were trusses that were being set and there were lots and lots of contractors showing up. So I stood in the kitchen and I was chatting with Liz a little bit about this as we were standing in the kitchen. I go, you know, I'm talking to Jesus. I'm talking to Jesus about those people. There's people all over my property and I don't know who Jesus wants to talk to or what's going on with Jesus and these people. So I started talking to Jesus and I started talking to the people. I started making small talk. I was going out there and catching their names, finding out where they're from, finding out a little bit about them and talking to Jesus. And Jesus really highlighted two of them. I promise you, I don't know why that is. You know, if there's six or eight people on my property and Jesus is really highlighting two of them, I can't explain that. I don't know why that is. But he was highlighting two of them to me. And when I say highlighting, meaning there was, I had a sense or an impression that there were two people that he was going to, that he had prepared, that were ripe, maybe, ripe for the harvest. And there, there were those two people. And I was talking to Jesus, praying, saying, Jesus, who do you want me to talk to? What do you have for me? What, do, what message do you have for these people? Where can I join you in your work? Please talk to me. Please point them out. Please show me what I need to know about these people. So I knew who the two were, so I started talking more to the first one. I found out a lot about his life, how many children he had, where he lived, what he did before he was a contractor. I was just popping in and out, chatting over a couple of days. And then as I kept talking to Jesus, Jesus said to me, and when I say that, I don't hear him audibly. I don't think I've ever heard him audibly, but it's like as I'm talking, and new information comes into my head, and I'm asking Jesus for information, and then new information hits my mind, my assumption is that it's Jesus giving me that information. That's how I hear the Lord. Um, eight and a half times out of 10, it's usually right. Not always, so sometimes you look a fool. But if you're gonna look a fool, you might as well look a fool for Jesus. So what he said to me was that man had a praying grandmother, and I heard had, I think the grandmother was with Jesus, had a praying grandmother who knew Jesus and who prayed over that man all her days, who prayed over that man. And this man was about my age. So once I heard that, I went to him and said, hey, you know, I was talking to Jesus about you. I know that's awkward and uncomfortable. <laughs> I don't know what to say. It's what the gospel told me to do it. So I said, hey, I was talking to Jesus about you. My sense from Jesus is that you had a praying grandmother who knew him, who prayed over your life. He took some steps back and he was like, yeah? And I was like, well, I said, Jesus is pursuing you from those prayers. Jesus wants a relationship with you. He goes, ma'am, I haven't lived a good life. I'm like, I hear you. That's why you need Jesus, <laughs> right? He wants relationship with you. He wants to forgive you, rebuild life with you, love you. He wants to be in relationship with you. He was like, wow, okay. I kind of left it at that. I don't really have anything more to say to him. I hope, I pray, I pray for him. Like he knows Jesus is pursuing him. He knows it's Jesus because I had no way to know that he had a praying grandmother who was with Jesus, right? Jesus revealed that to me so that I could share it with him so that, so that this man would know that Jesus is pursuing him. So I prayed and I'm like, well, I hope you'll say yes to Jesus. I hope you'll follow him. Like he loves you. He wants relationship with you you're forgiven. I said, I didn't have, I didn't always live a good life either. Like, Jesus wants to be in relationship with you. So I left it at that. It's my job to do what I feel Jesus is asking and to plant those seeds. Lane said a couple weeks ago that he read a quote somewhere, and he'll clear it up at week five, because I can't remember exactly what it was, but something like, and I don't even remember where he got it, but something like Jesus is having a conversation with everyone and we are, are to join Jesus in that conversation. That's the conversation I think Jesus was having with that particular man was, hey. Hang on a second. The second man 
Jesus was highlighting to me, and I couldn't quite figure out what was going on there. I wasn't really hearing something specific like that. My sense was that the second man maybe already knew Jesus, but I didn't really know what was going on, and I kept praying. So, Thanks for being patient. <clears throat> I think maybe the enemy doesn't want me to tell these stories, huh? So the second man uh, I went up to, and again, I had interacted with him a couple times, shared some small talk with him, got to know him a little bit, as best I could in a couple days while he's trying to actually do his job. And <clears throat> I said to him, hey, do you know Jesus? Because it seemed to me like he did, right? Do you know Jesus? And he's like, well, it's complicated. I was like, oh, okay, what's going on there? And he's like, well, <clears throat> I lost three children. I said, man, I could feel the weight of that. I was like, oof, okay. I said, that's hard. That's really, really hard. I said, well, I said, I've been talking to Jesus <clears throat> about all you guys, and um, he highlighted you to me, so... I just want you to know that he's with you in that grief. That is really hard stuff. I'm really sorry. Um, he told me that the first two children had been lost in very young age, infancy, uh, from something medical. And the third child was older, and it was suicide. Like, man, that is rough. I'm really sorry. Jesus is with you in that grief. And he was like, thank you. And that was about it. But after I got that information from that man, I went, back to him, I went back to Jesus and I was like, hey, what else you got for this guy? That's rough. That's really hard. Talk to me more. And I got two things from Jesus in that case. Uh, one was she's with him. And two was her dad was her best friend. So the next day, I went back to this man, and I was like, hey, I talked to Jesus a little bit about your situation and about your daughter in particular, and I want you to know a couple things. Uh, one, the Bible does not say that suicide is the unforgivable sin. It doesn't say that anywhere. I know that that is what people say, but it's not. Uh, anytime there's a suicide, that is the unfortunate result of a mental health crisis. And secondly, <clears throat> Jesus told me uh, that he has her, she's with him, and I want you to know that. And um, he told me that she, you were her best friend. He stopped, his eyes filled up with tears. He said, I was. Now again, that's not something I would have ever known, that that's what their relationship was, right? So I'm like, Jesus is with you in this grief. I'm really sorry about your loss. So I'm not sure what kind of barriers this man may have put up in his life or how he may have been feeling about God after those kinds of losses. I can't even imagine processing those kind of losses. But the conversation that Jesus was having with this man was, I'm here. I have her. I have your children. I'm here. I'm with you in this grief. So I was able to share that message with that man. So it is my hope, and I continued to pray, it is my hope and my prayer that that man will draw near to Jesus in this grief, and that somehow God will meet him and take that very, very painful story and make beauty from ashes, and he'll meet him in it. I, mean, I can imagine a lot of people might turn away from God if they had walked through something like that. So I believe the message in that case for him was, I love you, I'm here, and I have your kids. That's a rough message. But God wanted to meet him in it. So as we talk over these next five weeks about these tasks of caring for the vulnerable and the orphan and the imprisoned and the prostituted. We're gonna have people available to pray. We're gonna talk about obstacles, which I'm gonna do in a second. And we're gonna to try to help our church body who, especially people who aren't clear about how and where you're called. I believe that as it relates to both the gospel 
and the oppressed, we all kind of have a circle and we need to be talking to God and be paying attention to what's in our circle. But I also believe that the vast majority of us have a skill set and sort of a specific call to help the overarching problem. I talk about Peace Promise a lot because I've been involved in it for 16 years, but also in this congregation, Rebecca Kipe and Patty Lebo and Gabby Fish are involved with Peace Promise. We all do something different there. We all bring our gifts and our talents as God designed us to this problem to help those women come out of vulnerability which keeps them then from being prostituted by others. So we're all using our gifts according to the way that God made us. So Gabby Fish is an accountant, right? So she is our director of finance and does treasury work, but she also shows up sometimes and does soaps by survivor events. She also picks up something that somebody needs and transports it or gives a ride to a gal that needs a ride or something of that sort. Patty Lebo does something that we all do something different according to our gifts, but we're very clear. We know what that call is. So I hope that every single person will find uh, your call, whatever that is, to help those who are in vulnerable situations, will be awakened to the love relationship with God, will move toward him in prayer and become aware of our surroundings and very focused on these tasks. The things that I see in my own life and in the lives of people around me that prevent us from walking this out are distractions, I think that societally we're very distracted by a lot of things, whether that be technology or culture or television or shopping or whatever it is. I think the culture, I know the culture, is governed by the evil one and is trying to pull us toward a different mission, which is very self-focused and very self-centered and very materialistic, right? The culture would have us, instead of focusing on sharing the gospel and caring for the oppressed, the culture would say, you really need your car upgraded. You really need this hairstyle and a pumpkin spice coffee and these shoes and you need to go to this vacation place and have us focus on other goals instead of to keep us distracted and busy. God wants us busy doing his work. The culture wants us busy acquiring things and status and attention from others. I believe that we can be following the wrong crowd, even the wrong Christian crowd. So I think we need to be very careful. If the crowd we're following, even the Christian crowd we're following, is not repeatedly sharing this message about these tasks of sharing the gospel and caring for the poor and the orphan and the widow, if the crowd that we're following isn't repeatedly sharing that message, it's probably the wrong crowd. I don't think there's anything wrong with going really, really deep with God. I think we need to do that. But I have seen some Christians replace those important tasks with just going deep with God, which is consuming all the goodness of God just for yourself and not sharing it. I've seen that over and over. Make sure you're following the right crowd. Fear and timidity. I have not given you a spirit of fear or timidity, but of love, power, and a sound mind. If there's anything that keeps us from having conversations, from asking God, for engaging where he's called us to engage in the spirit realm, the things we can't see, it's probably a spirit of fear or timidity or unbelief. Unbelief that God's not serious about this. I promise you he is. We just read it or unbelief that we can do it, right? Our belief isn't in us, it's in him. And we're all gonna have a different style. Unbelief that the harvest isn't ripe, I don't know. Unbelief, fear, timidity, those things can become a spirit that oppress us and keep the church locked down so that we're not doing what God has tasked us to do in this world. Remember the picture that I painted of the church. If the church were as alive and active as I believe God wants the church to be, there would be no foster kids or lonely people or hungry people. There would be none because 
if every person in every church that is meeting this morning were as active as God wants us to be, there would be nobody in foster care. There would be nobody hungry in this region because we would be doing our job. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up, and I want to say a bit about response. Uh, First of all, if you've heard me preach before, I've said this multiple times, and I'm going to continue to say it. When we have a sense that the Lord is stirring us, whatever that feels like, pressure of some sort, I don't know, tingly feelings on the inside. I'm not sure how you might sense the Holy Spirit moving in your life. If you sense that and you push it down over and over and over and you don't respond to the Holy Spirit, your heart becomes hard and you stop hearing him. So if you are in a place right now where you're like, Lord, your word just opened me up and I recognize I've got distractions or I've got a spirit of fear and timidity or something of that sort that I need deliverance from, and you're not, uh, and you're going to stay in your seat, then eventually your heart gets hard and you stop sensing the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit trying to get you to move, to move from your seat, to move into action, to move away from lying spirits that tell you to be afraid, that's the Holy Spirit. So move. If the Holy Spirit is, is prompting you, please move so that your heart can remain soft and your ears can remain open. Also, there's some extra prayer people today because it's my hope and prayer that lots of you will respond. You're going to recognize most of them. Pastor Lane will be up. Regular prayer people will be up. But I also asked Dwayne and Julia Johnson to be here. Probably half our congregation knows who they are. They go to Grantham Bick. They're founders of 180 Ministries, who does exactly this, helps the poor and the oppressed. So they're here to be on the prayer team too. So please go to anyone on the prayer team and ask them to pray. Whatever the Lord is laying on your heart, we want you to press into that and to be set free and have obstacles removed so that you and all of us together can do the work of God in this region. We're going to go into worship. Amen.